hello everybody. It is officially hotter than hell here now. Um, <clears throat> on a side note, I just ate this and feel like I had done something wrong. This is a, a boss cookie from Lenny and Larry. Two guys that I don't know if I should trust them anymore. <clears throat> but today, we are back to our Cthulhu Mythos and um, going through it. We're doing the Whisper in the Darkness. And <clears throat> in the reread of this, um, and I, I mean, I seriously, I've read this story so many damn times. Um, I, I noticed something about Lovecraft that um, I have noticed in the past, but um, it's just so odd. Like, most writers, they'll write, like, kind of like a background for a story they're going to do. And then that background will never get published. That is just for their information. So they could, like... Um, go back and like figure out shit if they need to or whatever. And it seems like Lovecraft uses all of his notes that he'll jot down for something as like important backstory for the story. And the first chapter of this, like, all, like if this was any other writer, I would say it's completely unnecessary. But because Lovecraft has this almost journalistic travel writer mentality with his work, um, a very antiquarian um, romanticism. I, I don't know how else to put it. It's it's slightly charming, even if the stuff he's talking about is kind of grotesque. But the main gist of this story. Um, is the correspondence between a guy in Vermont and a guy in Arkham. Um, and they are both scholarly types. And originally, um, Akeley, the guy in Vermont, is kind of warning our protagonist off of getting involved in researching certain things because there are these beings from outer space that live in the hills of Vermont and um, he has evidence of them. He recorded their meetings. He um, took photographs of them. He has, like, there's these prints. And the horror of this and it's so like typical Lovecraft the horror of all of this stuff is the stuff you don't see and the narrator even says as much he's like um, I can't remember the exact line but it's like um, ah, I can't remember the exact line but he talks about how like he, uh, it's not, it's, it's almost like what he didn't see was the thing that unnerved him so much. And there are some really cool bits if you follow, like, the Lovecraft lore and, like, the whole mythology of everything. Um, 
but these creatures are the Migo, the um, kind of insectoid looking aliens. And they talk about this new planet that's been discovered past Neptune, which is Pluto. But um, in this, it's uh, Yugoth. So, like, the fungi from Yugoth and all that stuff, like, this is that. And um, some other cool shit in here is the, the, the recording is of a kind of like a ritual that the Migo are doing. And they talk about um, Nyarlathotep and his waxen mask. And so that leads a lot of people to believe that the shocking end of this story um, is that that was really Nyarlathotep. Um, which it could be. You know, you never know. <clears throat> But, uh, anyway, so there's this correspondence back and forth, and it's almost like espionage-ish, because someone's been intercepting the correspondence between the two guys, and, um, in one instance, the guy in Arkham actually got a telegram, supposedly from Akeley telling them to, like, not worry about anything and just go on about your business, everything's fine here. And it turns out that he never sent that telegram. And, um, so there's just all this, like, weird kind of suspense shit. And most of this is told kind of in, um, an epistolary fashion where, um, it's funny because it's like, he doesn't have any of these letters anymore. So he's like, just remembering what the letter said. And it made me think, like, I wonder if people did that way back in the day. Like, when letter writing was really the only form of long distance communication. That you would read a letter and then read it again and read it again and read it again. To the point where, like, it almost, like, becomes like your favorite song or something like that that you know all the words to. <clears throat> um, it's just hard to imagine how us today would be able to do that kind of shit. So in that sense, that part of this story might feel a little dated. But um, this, the, the <clears throat> my favorite bit of the story is when our hero goes to Akeley's house, and um, that's when shit, like, kicks into, like, 11th gear, and I don't know, it's weird, because when I'm not, like, giving you a play-by-play -play of what happens in a story, I always feel like I shouldn't tell you the things that happen at the end. Um, but basically, at this point, Akeley's like, yeah, you know, I was wrong. I went after these guys and was shooting them without asking them any questions. And they're really cool motherfuckers, and, like, we're, like, all bros now, and they're gonna put my brain in a jar and take me back to Yugoth, and, you know, I'll be able to talk through, like, a, a voice box, like, at the Taco Bell drive through or something. And, um, uh, let's see here. Okay, sorry, that was something completely different. Well, anyway, so the way this ends and what our hero finds is, um, quite shocking, but also quite predictable from a Lovecraft stance. And it has, like, the, like, go-to Lovecraft way of telling the story where, like, the last line is, like, and then right there it was this! Like, with an exclamation point. And you're like, holy shit! It's like, 
you just watch the Twilight Zone, and the Twilight Zone, as soon as the twist comes, um, it, like, cuts off, and then that's it. Um, so for those of you who are fans of Lovecraft, this does the, the same thing for you here. Um, yeah, I don't want to tell you too much more about it. Um, I want you to go read it. Um, but man, it is like... I feel like so much of this story isn't needed, but it never makes you feel like, come on, come on, get on with it. It's a... I don't know, I almost wish that Lovecraft wrote all of these stories from his point of view, like these things really happened. Um, because all of his protagonists are extremely similar, like they all feel like the same guy anyway. Um, and then, like, if you have your whole, your Randolph Carter stuff, um, you're like, oh, well, that's him, so... But, um, God, man, it's like telling an entire story through the remembrance of letters. Like, if you were to fucking pitch that to anybody, they would go, yeah, that's a shit idea. We're not going to do that. But somehow Lovecraft does it, and you're like, oh, shit. You know, so, I mean, again, like, think what you want of what a piece of shit he was in real life or whatever, you know, but you can't take away the talent that he has and, like, doing things that no one else in their right mind would ever do, and he finds a way to make it work. So, um, it's a great story. Um, definitely give it a read. Um, I just went and put At the Mountains of Madness up on weirdmass.com so you could read that um, and prepare for next week because that's a beefy fucker, okay? At the Mountains of Madness is like, I think it's like 12 or 13 chapters. It's one of his longer pieces. So um, get ready for that. And... Um, yeah, and then if you are going to submit for Weird Mass 25, the cutoff is uh, July 31st. Yes, July 31st, so have it to me by then. Um, and you can just send that to either weirdmaskzine at gmail.com or ihatematwall at gmail.com. I don't care. So, um, and I will talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.